Greetings from uh, our staff at home. They're at home working while uh, we're here. Um, I was asked by the Red Power to give some history of our company for this past hundred years. Um, so traveling with me is my wife, and uh, she's been putting up with me for a few years. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a little history of our company, and then I do have some international stuff that uh, this are, it's my opinion, it's things that I remember may not be what the people before me said to you, but maybe it was more down home. So, uh, our business started in 1919 by my grandfather as a feed mill. Uh, one of the interesting things in the early years was, and I don't know what he had for building to start with, but he tore down an ammunition building in Haldersburg, which is about 10 miles away, brought up the crescent, reassembled it, and that's part of our feed mill building up today. Uh, we sold, over the years, a lot of different things. Amco feed, we had grain, flour, cornice, tack, farm supplies, paint, flint coat roofing, nails, hardware, along with the farm implements, which were McCormick, Ontario drill, new idea, and even right-way milking equipment. We farm off tractors and equipment, and kind of the beginning, as the former speaker said, of the uh, combines and the bailers. Uh, my grandfather uh, had four, uh, four sons. Dad was the oldest, and the uh, tall Jim Bill. Uh, they all grew up working at the mill. And uh, during the 40s, which was the war years, there was some interruptions. And uh, after that, uh, his one brother, Jim, uh, he bought a feed mill in Haldisburg. And he sold equipment at that feed mill also. Then bought a second mill in Roaring Springs where we had case tractors of all things. So we did have some discussions about that in the early days. But anyway, Dad, Paul, and Bill, those three stayed at the Crescent and uh, renamed it the Crescent Feed Mill. Just took out the flour, which we didn't do anymore. So Brother Gene and I grew up in the business, and we assumed various uh, positions along the way. We assembled equipment, we had unloaded railroad cars, with shipments of oats, poultry equipment was big, fencing was big, the flour, tractors, implements, and truckloads of fertilizer, lime, cement, steel roofing, shingles, tar paper. We had all that stuff back then. We did grinding and mixing of feed batches, loading trucks for our, our, our own trucks as well as customers, shoveling grain in and out of the bin, shoveling grain into boxcars during the wheat harvest. Uh, so we, we were kept busy. Uh, and then as we got older to drive, we were delivering also. One of the things we delivered in those days, we had thousands of broiler chickens, and uh, we hauled feed to them. In the early days, it was 100-pound bags. And the interesting thing about the 100-pound bags was sometimes they had to be put up here on a platform or whatever, or even taped and dumped into somebody's dump bin. So, uh, one of the jobs I got was to meet up with the driver that needed helper, and after school I'd go with him and help boost this feed up onto the platform. Well, in 1960, uh, we had another change in the business. Dad and his brother Bill bought out Brother Paul, and they formed a corporation, which just added incorporated to the name. <coughs> And uh, the business continued to grow, and 
naturally the equipment business was growing too. So as it grew, we had to think about building or buying something to have room for equipment. So in 64, we bought ground out of town, got a building started, and in April of 65, we moved into the new base of operations, Gene and I in charge. Uh, and then about 10 years later, uh, our Uncle Bill, he sold us his share of the business. Uh, so Gene and I became owners along with our dad. And um, we had a reorganization about 1978, which uh, dad was kind of semi-retired at the time. Uh, I became the president, dad was the vice president and treasurer, and Gene the secretary. Dad passed away in 81, so that left Gene and I, the owners of the corporation. We both uh, have uh, two sons each, Joe and Steve, or my sons. Steve is here with us now. He's camping here. Uh, Joe's at home working. And uh, Dennis and Dave were Gene's sons. And they all grew up in the business, working various positions also. So the new expansion in uh, 83 was a branch door that we opened in Altoona. Interesting enough, Mother um, Harvester wasn't too much in favor of us opening a store because it would cross the mountain in a different area. So we went in as a cup cadet dealer and uh, we, we did sell equipment there also. But, um, our older son, Joe, he was the manager. And then um, both Steve and Dave, they, when they got through with their school, they came working at the, basically at the Crescent store. Dave did spend some time at Altoona immediately after, and even during college days. And uh, Dave also kind of up, uh, heads the Somerset store. Well, anyway, uh, Dennis, he got out of school, and he was <clears throat> more of the animal type of guy. So he finished his schooling, went to a couple different big farms and worked as herdsmen and so forth, came back, and he started to run the feed mill. So we had the bases covered for that. Uh, and then in uh, year 2000, uh, the four boys became stockholders along with myself. And that was the same year the negotiations started for a two-store complex. And uh, we, we talked about it and kicked it around. And during those negotiations, which was February of 2009, Brother Gene passed away unexpectedly. So reorganization was done again, and uh, I retained as president. Joe and Dennis uh, were vice president, Steve, treasurer, Dave, secretary. The board proceeded with the purchase, and the two complex had, had, was purchased in April of nine, and added two stores, one in Everett and one in Somerset. We moved. Uh, from the leased location in Everett to a property we bought in Bedford is kind of interesting, uh, hard work, but interesting. The, uh, we did the same thing in Somerset. Actually, Somerset was first. The, Somerset was um, a nice location. It was in a strip mall and no service facilities um, other than for a cup cadet. So, we also got a building and moved across town. But when it came time to move, we got a van trailer, backed it into the dock, and for about two weeks, the parts guys loaded everything in the, in the van that we didn't need on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, when the, uh, it's Saturday, which we were waiting on customer Saturday morning, but by noon, we hooked onto the trailer and we had all kind of help, uh, employees, uh, friends, relatives, everybody. 
So we got moved, and this was at both stores at two different times. Uh, Monday morning, we were open for business. It took a lot of work to do it, but we pulled it off twice. The, each store uh, was set up to have a uh, manager on staff with sales, parts, and service, which is part of our goal to get done. And um, the bookkeeping all remained at the Crescent store. We have about 36 employees, um, and a lot of them are involved with parts and service. Our son Joe has three sons, and today they all continue to work in our business also. They've all done their schooling and worked in their spare time and summers. So today, uh, one is head mechanic, and two of them are store managers. Our daughter, now retired, is a part-time in-store salesperson. Enough for that. We're going to talk about tractors. Uh, the first note I have here is on uh, the fast hitch, which, you know, in the, probably, uh, I guess in 54, 55 was the number of tractors. And the funny thing about that, they came out about the same year I started to get paid as an employee. So we both kind of started together, but the number of tractors, it did put us in a different uh, category. Uh, we, we had a lot of new tractor sales at that time. One of the things I have noted here is fast hitch. They were available on the number of tractors, and you could buy a kit for a, uh, a smaller size fast hitch to put on a Super C. And we did a lot of them. Another thing we did a lot of was the 300, 350, up through the 450, came out as six bolt uh, starting systems that wasn't enough. And we converted, I think, every tractor we ever sold to 12 volt. Another change that we made back then uh, on the Farmo 400, it had a small fuel tank. So we had a change to a tank that was made a couple gallons bigger. Don't remember exactly. We had thousands of acres of potato farms back then. And uh, two of the things was you had to have a wide front axle and you had to have a shifting drawbar. Well, an H and an M had a manual shifting drawbar, and some had been converted to hydraulic. But with the new fast hitch on the 300 through the 450 and so forth, all they had was a pull bar that slid on the fast hitch drawbar. So we, along with a neighboring dealer, probably built a hydraulic shifting drawbar on every tractor that went to a potato farmer. Uh, moving on into the 140 and the 560 days, uh, people all know about the 460 breaking down. Uh, in our case, there was one at Evansburg on the pulling track that fell apart. We ourselves had one heavy worked 460 that had some issues, but it was all bearing related and I paid to replace the bearings in those 460s, and it pretty much ended the problem. They also, at the same time, developed Hytran. The hydraulic transmission fluid was made so that it could be used to lubricate these bearings, take care of the gears, lubricate the TA, as well as hydraulic fluid, because we used the transmission rear end case as the hydraulic reservoir to get a lot of gallons uh, to avoid the heat. So uh, along with the Hytran, we also got a number one diesel engine oil, and which, which it was a Series 3 oil, and then we also got the number one um, low ash engine oil for gasoline engines. Um, the the uh, 
um, engine valves on, especially the 460 and 560, would tend to build up with an ash content. And that was a big part of the reason for the invention of the low ash oil. It would correct that uh, build up of ash, and it also worked on farm oil, cub, or any of the smaller tractors. Uh, 460 and 560 were basically doing the heavier work, so it was worse there. But if with it, that ash would actually torch a valve, just the same as if you were to take a cutting torch and cut a pie-shaped piece out of the face of the valve. That's just exactly what happened. So low ash engine oil corrected that. And saying that, most of the 560, 460s we sold were all gas engines. The 560 diesel was around, the 460 was around. They were never real popular in those early days. The next thing came along was the government taking the lead out of gasoline, and that created a lot of problems. I'm sure there are lots of people here that know about that. But just uh, eight spark plugs and uh, you, sometimes it wouldn't even start or miss on one or two cylinders. And by changing or cleaning the spark plug, you could go back to work. And it wasn't every tractor. So it had to do with the way the tractor was being used or idled or whatever. But for some people, in my opinion, the only cure was to be a diesel engine. We had one old older farmer that had a farm all H and uh, our neighboring dealer actually overhauled it for him and he came in and he said it's just not reporting, re performing correct. He said they did a good job they put this probably a high apple tube kit you know and all that. So we said why don't you put low ash oil in that farm all H? So he bought the oil in the filter, went home, changed it, and a while later he'd come back and he asked for a case of that miracle oil. That was his opinion, and that's what the way it worked. It was, and still is, good oil for this gas tractor. Well, we always sold industrial equipment from the time we had an I-300, 350 Paco loader, T6, T9, 40 series uh, come out. We had the crawler, we had the 3850 wheel loader, we had the yellow or 140 with a A105 or 110 highway mower. We had an I-340 or an I-460 with a forklift, T5 uh, crawler, and a little later on, we had a TDC-5B, which was a rubber-tired uh, crawler equipped with a log arch and a winch and a uh, long push braid on the front. And then with the introduction of the 3414, 3444, 3514, 3616, and then later the 34, 100, 35, and 3600 loader and hoe, uh, as well as the 500, 500C, 500E, T7, T8, T70, T80, uh, the crawler dozers, and then the crawler loaders, 100C, 100E, and so forth. Then we had the, um, as I mentioned, the 3850 uh, was a loader, a four-wheel drive loader tractor. But then they expanded that to a 3800, which uh, was a loader backhoe, and later a 34, uh, 3830 four-wheel drive. Uh, they were made in Louisville. And uh, the advanced model was a 510 Hayline style four-wheel drive loader. And even back then, we had an S7B four-wheel drive skid loader. So we have a, a large selection of, of industrial equipment. Uh, a little story that we ran into, uh, a local contractor was uh, building a factory, and uh, he had a Case 320 backhoe, and he just couldn't dig. 
Well, we had just received the 3414D with that 12-foot hoe, and we moved in with that backhoe and just dug where that case couldn't begin to dig. So we were real happy, and it went on from there, very successful unit. 1963 comes along, and uh, we got the 706, the 806, and the 1206. Well, our potato farmers were ready to move into potato harbor, but the M, Super M, MTA, 400, 450, 560, those tractors were big enough, near big enough, so the 706, 806, 1206 fit the bill, and they were an instant hit. And uh, what happened, the, the fellows that bought the tractor went out and bought a harvester too, because then they could use it. Dairy farmers soon realized that they could make much better time with a big tractor. Well, from then, the highest we want was 60 horsepower, 63. So now we were in the of 73, and uh, they would go out and save a lot of field time between milk and milk. And one interesting little thing is. 1964, you could buy 806 diesel and a 550, five bottom, seven mile $8,500. And today that would get you a payment on that. Uh, we had the 656 hydro introductory days where any dealer that wanted to uh, with the company would bring a, a demo unit to them. And uh, we did that. It was very successful. And we were even uh, successful in selling that demo to one of our customers at the end of the demonstration period. It was very popular for us, as well as the introduction of the 826, the 1026 hydros, uh, two very popular. Uh, I think at the time, if I remember right, we sold one gold. 826 and three gold 1026s, which everybody didn't get them, but we did. Uh, and these bigger hydras work great on a potato harvester. Well, our district office uh, back in those earlier days were, uh, we were zone four out of Pittsburgh. And it consisted of uh, Western Pennsylvania and some Eastern Ohio dealers. And um, kind of before my time, they had moved from downtown Pittsburgh up to Leedsdale, which was up the river, uh, to an industrial park type of place. And they had, um, out of uh, Leedsdale or the Pittsburgh Zone 4, there were two company stores that I remember. One was Columbus, Ohio, and one was Indiana, PA. Well, we were naturally close to Indiana, so a lot of our uh, meetings were held at the Indiana store. Uh, we were one of uh, maybe five sales districts out of Pittsburgh, and uh, we were actually the furthest east of any other dealers on Zone 4. Our Crescent Mountain was a dividing line. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, dealers back then. Some of the ones that were closer to us uh, worthy to mention, like Fred Weakling was in Carrolltown, Elmer Hoffman was in Johnstown, George Bender in Somerset, Paul Snyder in Catani, uh, Hardy Fitchko in the air, Dennis Bull in Washington, Wally Reed up in New Ringle, uh, John Moyer in Latro. Delmon Thompson up in Greenville, Gordon Rice at Clarion. Uh, there was just maybe 50 dealers out of Zone 4. Uh, There's a couple of dealers still there. Hetrix are still there in New Bethlehem. Uh, Labuda's in Harmony. Uh, Catherine's still there at Union City. And Pennock's up at McKean. Well, you got part of this story from the previous speaker, but the Pittsburgh office closed in 1967. We were relocated to Harrisburg, the very place he talked about. So that went along pretty good, but Hurricane Agnes hit in 1972, flooded the entire Harrisburg city. Uh, 
the warehouse portion of the um, Harrisburg district was more or less the first floor. The offices were on the second floor. And the whole farm show complex across the street was flooded. So that meant the end of uh, Harrisburg. And we, you know, we got moved on. I think uh, we've been to Albany, we've been to Syracuse, and Buggles. But anyway, we don't do that anymore. We, we just work out of uh, Wisconsin. Our parts department was another issue. Uh, we worked out of Baltimore, Maryland until they put a new warehouse in Columbus. And we were switched. After being moved there, we found uh, the parts they stocked were not what we sold. And the service, the delivery service out of Columbus was terrible. So eventually, we got moved back to uh, Baltimore until other things changed. But and I want to mention one individual in particular, who, uh, Sam Shockey. He was our uh, district sales manager starting in the late 50s. He had grown up in the business, I don't know how many years he had, but as a younger IH employee, he knew the farmers in the area. He had traveled and visited with them. So, uh, his position uh, in the early 50s was in the Ivory Tower, which was the IH World Headquarters in Chicago. I don't know which floor it was. It could have been the 18th, it could have been the 26th. I don't know that. But at any rate, he was instrumental in getting the service manuals produced. Uh, we only had limited uh, service manuals for older tractors and equipment. By the time the number of series tractors were introduced, we had a complete service library. Sam returned to Zone 4 as a district manager, and then uh, about 59, he became our territory sales manager. And uh, the poor man, uh, he died of cancer and other complications, but he was a very helpful individual for in us days. in those days. Sam? Sam Chalky. Did you ever hear of him? Yeah, his district manager, I think, ended up as a zone manager in Harrisburg, I think. He never was zone manager in Harrisburg. No, he was in Pittsburgh for a while. No, he was his, No, that was John Chalky, his brother, who was a zone okay, manager. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, we never had John. Okay. Uh, so my part of the story, as I said earlier, yeah, okay. my experience. Uh, but there was John and Sam, and they had a, a yeah, nephew, it was John's son, Don, yep. who worked out of Pittsburgh and other places. He could have been in Harrisburg very easily. Uh, okay. He has since retired. Well, uh, another man that I saw him here earlier, and I think he left, was Rich Merrill. He was our service man, not back that far, but for a long time we had Rich, and he did an excellent job taking care of us, both as IH and Case IH. So since then he retired. Um, you know, back uh, in the, I guess, mid to late 70s, Case I, or the IH it was, had a XL dealer program our dealership at the goal, and the reward was an annual trip with a spouse and some of the IH executives to various places for a weekend retreat and business meetings, as you can imagine. So, in the early 80s, we saw Cup Cadet go to Modern and Poland. We went with them. We also witnessed the industrial equipment going to Dresser. We stayed with them until when through the, uh, they went to Anderson Equipment as a, more or less as a distributor, and they had no interest in small equipment or parts that we needed. So that ended that. Well, on November 26, 1984, we received the announcement that an agreement had been reached with Tenneco, the parent company of J.I. Case. 
and the agreement was not to include the farm mall or the Memphis plants. That same day, we were to receive an IH airplane ticket from IH uh, with hotel accommodations for a rollout meeting at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Dallas. And at that meeting, we were welcomed by Jim Kettleson, mentioned earlier. Did you know Jim Kettleson? Well, he was the president of Tenneco, I think a, a good guy. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about whatever he might have said to welcome us, I don't remember, but he did tell us, he said, we will paint a red stripe on the tractors. Well, there was more booing than you could ever imagine from that audience. So Jim come right back, he says, we will make the stripe a little wider. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think it was too many days later the tractors were red. Uh, the leftover case tractors that were that cream color, whatever it was, they got painted red. And uh, we, we moved into the case tractor market. Uh, the couple of things that were going on there, uh, the 1896 and the 2096 had just come out with a new CDC engine, more or less the year before, or within the year before us meeting there. They showed them to us, and when they were painted red, they were an instant hit for us. Um, they were a good size and uh, they were po very popular, performed very well, so we weren't uh, unhappy with them. We had our own 84 and 85 series, and along with the 1896 and 2096, we did not care for the big case tractors because they went too fast in first gear, and we couldn't put them in a potato harvester. Two mile an hour, roughly, was their bottom speed. So we had our own 88 series tractors to sell. That everybody saw what they were and heard the story, two plus twos included. So by the end of uh, that era, uh, we moved into 1987, where we got the Magnum. And in 89, we got the Maxim. So along with the 85 series, we had a complete tractor line, and we were in the tractor business. So thank you for having us, and uh, I'll do it like the other if you have any questions. <laughs> See me after.